Hi, I'm Sunay Naeem, and I'm in 12th grade. I'm Sylvia Fagali, and I'm also in 12th grade. I'm Louisa Kelly, and I'm in 12th grade. I'm Farida Garcia Bengochia, and I'm also in 12th grade. I'm Diala Jindali, and I'm also in 12th grade. I'm Andy Condi, and I'm also in 12th grade. And we are the Girl Scout Troop 002, and we received funding from the Global Citizenship Fund for our service trip to Jordan. Um, so uh, it's about a summer ago or two summers ago, we traveled to Jordan, um, and we um, brought supplies to refugee families, um, Palestinian and Syrian refugee families, and we basically delivered supplies to them, and we visited a couple orphanages, and we got a chance to just sit and talk with the families, and we learned a lot about like their life, and I think it really had a big impact on a lot of us. Um, me especially, I really um, learned that I take a lot for granted, and I really, I found that these, a lot of the kids couldn't go to school there, and often I'm the one that complains about going to school, or um, the families didn't have a lot of space in their houses, and I share, like, I complain when I have to share a room with my sister, and it's just, it was just a really um, eye-opening experience, and it gave me a chance to really realize that I have a blessed life, and that I should be more grateful for it. Does anyone else? I think, um, speaking of you mentioned the fact that like um, a lot of these families didn't have very much space. They were really limited. They have no. They had no resources. Um, I remember one family in specific. We got to their house, so we were given the addresses of the um, families we were going to send supplies to and deliver supplies to. So we got to their house, and it was just a single room. Um, there was a bathroom and a kitchen I think in the same room and it was it was about you know I mean it was just a small square it was yeah the size of half of this couch um and they had a bathroom and a kitchen in the same place and we were all looking around like where's the rest of you know their things they had no running water they had no um heating or cooling so they they had no way of making food even just because they had no supplies to do any of that. And it was, um, there was a mother and a newly born baby. Do you, it, it was like two months old, something like that. And they were all, I mean, you could tell that they hadn't been eating well because they had no way of making themselves food. They'd been eating canned sardines. And, um, and so it was just, these two parents with this newly born baby and the baby was obviously not getting enough nutrition either because you know the parents weren't either and we were just we were just so taken aback by the whole situation um so what we did was we ended up uh we went out and we bought them a stove we bought them fuel we bought them um pots and baby food and um just very very basic supplies that we wouldn't think would make such a big impact on a family's lives, um, but we were able to go out and do that for them because they didn't have the funding for themselves. And I remember when we gave it to them, the mother started crying. Um, they they thanked us all the way out to the car. They, I mean, they were so thankful, and we like we still felt like we hadn't you know done enough. So yeah. Speaking of families in really small spaces, there's another family that we saw that. It was a family of 15 and they were living in a garage at the bottom of an apartment building and the way they were getting money was the father was washing everyone's cars and everyone's windows and one of the girls who actually wasn't a part of that family she was just living with them she sat us down and she told us about how her father died in Syria and how they didn't know until yeah, they found him just lying on their doorstep. Someone brought his body to them. And he went out for bread, and he, like, he came back dead. And she talked about it like it was so mundane, like it happens to everyone. Like, like oh, that didn't happen to you? Oh, like, good, good for you. Lucky. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was such a common story for them. And, it, like, it still blows me away to think that, like, 
her parent went out for bread and came back and like it was completely acceptable that he wasn't alive when he came back. Um, yeah, just also another thing about that fam that family. Um, so you said that the father was washing cars to keep them, to get them by. And also as well, because there were so many people in such a small space, they had the father I know I knew had to sleep outside. And I think what was so um, just really interesting and just kind of moving about the whole thing is that, I mean, back in Syria, he was, didn't he, he, he was an engineer. yeah, he was an engineer. He was a very well-off man and he, you know, had a good education. So he went from being a, a very successful engineer to washing cars to make a living. And so to add on to that, it's, it kind of goes to show how they really had no control over their situation. And um, it, it was definitely eye-opening to see situations that we don't really have control over either, but we were able to help in little ways. So it was you know, interesting to see things that we didn't even realize that we took for granted. For example, uh, education, uh, basic food, uh, like our water, our living. But uh, there was one family, especially just on the point of our education, they had, I think, two girls and one boy. And they weren't even going to school. They, they, they couldn't afford to go to school. And I just sat there in their living room thinking like, oh, I was just like complaining about final exams just before summer, like complaining about how dreadful they are. And there are these kids that are just longing to go to school and would do anything to go to school. And um, it's, it's definitely like eye-opening, especially when you have the funding to be able to actually send them to school in the end we were able to fund for at least the the boy the, and two girls from across the hall so yeah so a, so three children go to school which is it's it's a big difference to someone's life if you can actually send them to school especially three children yeah i remember that one boy that you're talking about um his name was Omran and I think the, the reason that the whole subject got brought up was um, we had been asking the families with kids because um, aid was coming up and we were asking them, you know, if we could bring you back anything, what would you want? And we'd been talking to little kids and they, you know, little kids, you know, they want toys. They want, you know, a coloring book, something simple like that. And we asked him, what, what can we, what do you want? What can we get for you? And his response was, I want to go back to Syria and I want to fight. And do you remember how old he was? He was, like he was like eight years old. There was this little eight-year-old boy, and we asked him what he wanted as a gift. And he said, I want to be sent back to Syria to fight for my country. And it blew all of us away. Like, I have goosebumps right now thinking about it. Um, <laughs> and his mom, oh, my goodness, I remember looking at her, and she just immediately, tears started running from her face and she was like we can't do that we can't go back there it's so violent um his father died you know in the violence it was it was so tragic and her, she was like her son her son was there um saying he wanted to go back to Syria and fight and and so we talked to him for a while and so we asked him again you know I mean if we could get you anything else what is it that you would want most and his second response was I want to go to school and he told us that he wanted to become an English teacher and there's this, here's this little eight-year-old boy and he wants to go to school he wants to become an English teacher he has all these aspirations and these hopes and it you know it, it broke my heart to realize um that there was nothing that he could do about any of that stuff and we you know we are so lucky to be here where we can um you know, think, what do I want to do with my life? Okay, well, let me take the steps to do that. But he was completely limited. He had no control over his situation at all. And his mom was trying her hardest, you know, to supply for them, to keep them all alive and to keep them safe. And it, it was just it, the least that we could do to help that. So I'm so, so proud that we were able to help him at least get on his way to... Um, you know, achieving that dream, and it's thanks to this, the fund that we were able to do that, so. 
And what's crazy about this is how close to home it is. It's it's just it's Jordan, which a lot of people go to for a vacation or from there, and it's just a couple hour plane ride away. And um, like Syria and Palestine, they're also really like close. And it's not some random third like like country just no one really just cares about. It's like very personal to us, I guess, especially living in this region. And so knowing that this kind of stuff is going on so close and like the families were had like good lives and it's just how so soon they were reduced to this it's just it's crazy to think and it makes you really just so much more thankful for what you actually do have going off of what she said it's like the majority of us have some kind of arabic background here and a lot of us have um have had turmoil in our countries for a while and it's like amazing like once we started seeing these people it was like all of a sudden like for me at least I saw them and they were like my family instantly it was like I could see my family in that position and it was absolutely heartbreaking because it was like it was so relatable that it hurt (laughs) like it was it was really it was like too close for me to like not like put myself in it in a way and like every like i feel like it's that whole experience has been ingrained like ingrained into my mind because like i feel like everyone that i met on that trip like it was a fraction of like a section of chance that made it so I wasn't a part of that family. Um, Yeah, going off of what you said as well, a a lot of us are, do have Arabic background and it gets a little confusing going to this school and going to an international school that has a very large Western populace, like a populace of students. So. I mean, for a while, I I think a lot of us felt a little bit disconnected from where we were from because we maybe had a difference in ideals or just opinions. But I think this trip was so, what was so amazing about this is that we got to see different families and people that maybe for a little bit of time were from a country that we felt disconnected from. But we started to see that, like, they were so similar to us that our aspirations and you know our fears and our dreams they kind of all matched up they sync together so you you kind of realize you don't really need what you thought you did to feel a connection to your home